Hey everybody, welcome back. It's time for the stream again. Um, Landon, if you want to get us started, Landon is here with us again this week. Hi guys, here is your favorite omniscient voice from the beyond. Um, <laughs> I am. Uh, we are also joined with a very special guest, uh, Naomi, why don't you say hi? Hello. Hey Naomi, we're so excited to have um, her joining us this week. Uh, and we've got some really exciting stuff planned for you guys. Hey, Lunar, how's it going? Um, hey, oh, hey, Brie. Oh, I'm so glad you could make it. Yay! Uh, <laughs> I saw that you followed, um, so I was really hoping you'd be able to come in and join us. Um, so thank you so much. <clears throat> and while um, while we kind of get started, while Landon kind of gets us started like she normally does, I'm going to go ahead and get the game going. Uh, so yeah, Landon, um, whatever you whatever you want to start with today. Well, I kind of well, clicks for that. Uh, the reason why Naomi has joined us, other than being just the wonderful human being that she is, is that today's topic is villains and uh, the uh, the challenges and rewards that come with playing villains inside of an RP and actually just writing villains all together. I think it's a really important discussion. Uh oh. Thank you for the follow. Oh, that was yay! Lunar Daydream. Thank you so much. Uh, we think it's just a really important discussion that every single story that has ever been told has an, attack an antagonist or a villain of some sort. And so being able to play one, being able to foster an environment that one can be played is really, really important. And so we wanted to discuss it. Yeah. Yeah, because conflict in in role play, that, or at least the type of role play that we're doing where we're really writing stories is super important. So I think yes. I do have a, a video like on some of my specific tips for playing and creating villains and things of that nature. But um, but we both think that this is a topic that also deserves um, more than just, you know, a 10 minute video. Right. So we're going to go a little bit deeper and get a little bit more opinions than just than just mine today. Yeah, and we all, we all have history, uh, You, the three of us at least, I can't speak to everyone in the chat, of writing um, villains. And uh, so we've all, we've all at some point either been the main villain or a side villain within one of our stories. Yeah. So it's, it's an experience that I think a well-rounded role, role player will come across at some point in time, even if it's not in a huge story-based RP or if it's someone who actually does enjoy playing a good guy someone is going to always be a villain in someone else's mind uh that's just how characters and um and conflict works so but before all of that we also want to remind people to give a follow to both the channel and then also karen's youtube and to remind people that we are also turning this into a podcast and we found a name. Yeah, we actually have a name for this yet. We four four episodes in or five this is the fifth episode and we finally have a name for um kind of what we're doing here. So uh so Landon, what's our name? Our name oh, is Thank you for the follow. Yay! Our name our name is Enter Stage Window because that's about how random we are. <laughs> uh, thank you for the follow. Thank you guys so much for um, for following. Yay! Um, yeah, so Interstage Window is a uh, traditional friendship trope, and it's also just a wonderful story trope. I always love it when a friend enters through the window in a time of crisis. I think it's a true, uh, true uh, testament to friendship. Yeah, and so I, I'd I'd call I'd crawl through your window anytime with consent <laughs> same likewise um open invitation there open invitation you can be the sam to my clarissa any day perfect <laughs> um yeah blink i'm always feeling nostalgic for this game i love it and i've played it so much that that's part of why we play it on the stream here is because it's very um it's very easy for me right so i can easily play it while we talk about stuff um but before we get into the topic today uh do we want to do favorite things um while people are kind of filtering into the into the chat today uh yeah let's do favorite things okay uh karen do you have one i do okay so my favorite thing okay so for y'all don't that don't know that don't remember from last year um my birthday's coming up it's on wednesday so um <laughs> this was actually a birthday gift from my mom i'm sure you guys have actually seen some of these um subscription for uh for like razors or other beauty products so she actually got me one and it's uh oh. it's this i've got it right here this Man. is the the billy one and um you can see I've, I've used a little bit so sorry it's a little bit gross, oh but like, it's got like this magnet here so it has like a really nice holder it is super sharp y'all so the reason why i'm sharing this um not sponsored god i wish billy contact me if you're interested <laughs> in but this is actually 
is actually a really good product. Oh my gosh. Well, happy birthday to your fiance, Brie. Um, this, so this is, it's actually a really good product. Like I, I, I truly um, can say that this is the best razor that I've ever used, uh, which is, I think, pretty freaking amazing. So, um, so yeah, Billy Razors, uh, I, I got it like uh, last week sometime. I've used it a couple times since then. Um, I freaking love it. I freaking love it. And, uh, and uh, I'm never going back. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. I love subscription. Oh, my gosh. Words are hard. I love subscription boxes like that uh, where you you can get something refreshed every month and it's even if it's just like a thing like a razor it's so it's so nice and it's just very self-carry and so it's awesome that your mom was able to do that for you yeah and it keeps me it's like another thing that i don't have to go to the store for right so it was really nice and yeah. thoughtful considering you know everything going on right now so very very much love it awesome um, what's your favorite so thing my week? favorite my favorite thing for this week is I was struggling between two, but we'll we'll go with one, and that is uh, <laughs> the wonderful thing that is therapy. Um, I suggest everyone should get some and be involved simply because in times like world pandemics, it's really nice to just have someone on your side, uh, mm -hmm. even if it's to rant to them. And that's what I needed this week because life is, as always, crazy. Mm. So. Totally That's what I've got. That. Totally agree with that. <laughs> um, and Naomi, do you have a favorite thing for this week? I do. Um, actually, it's a TV show that I convinced my friend Brie, who's in the chat, to watch. Ooh. And uh, it was a hit with her. And she's currently obsessed, so that's my win for the week. What's the show? Called, Tell us about it's it. It's Queen of the South. Okay. Uh, and it's essentially about a woman who is uh, a money changer on the streets of Mexico um, and it's basically her journey from um, like rags to riches she ends up this powerful cartel boss um, and it just shows her getting there and it's just fantastic oh it did I've I think I've seen trailers for it what is yeah. the woman who who's the star uh, Alice Bra Braga I can't say the name I'm British sorry um, <laughs> Alice Braga yeah Braga. yeah that one yeah uh yeah no i had seen and i had seen and heard about this that's awesome it's so good um and we're currently obsessed with uh the villain well they're all villains but um the big villain uh camilla vargas and Ooh. yeah she's just perfect and i think um because we're, we're talking about villains this week i had to mention her yeah well okay so let's let's get into it then let's start what about her makes her perfect like the perfect villain what what about her in particular well she's just so prideful and just so determined to reach her goals basically nothing can stop her apart from maybe her daughter um if she had to sacrifice herself for her daughter i think that would be the only thing that would that would actually stop her from getting where she wants to be um which makes her quite relatable as a mother um so i, I I, you know, jumps on that straight away, being in love myself. Um, and she's just got this tr just tranquil fury that she just never loses her calm. And when she does, pops off big time. And it's just really good to watch. It sounds like okay. major Cersei Lannister vibes, I'm not going to lie, which she's one of my yeah. favorites. So um, so I feel like now I have to watch this show, right? <laughs> yes, that's the goal. <laughs> so I like, the, I like the fact that you brought in, um, that you related to her. Like, I think that's something that is extremely important in a villain is that relatability, um, especially in current villains. I feel like in the last 10-ish years, that's probably shifted in media where our villains have become, instead of being the, you know, overall bad guys who were just unrelatable um, to now being relatable humans in a way that makes them even more scarier. Yeah. Um, um, I think but there's, this, there's a villain that, that comes to mind that I can't ever imagine relating to him. Oh, and he's just so chilling that it, he has to be my number one villain of all time. T give it um, to me. That's I don't know if you've seen uh, No Country for Old Men. Oh, that's a great I have, movie. I have yeah. not, but tell me about it. Okay, like, yeah, tell me about the villain. Right, he's called Anton uh, Ch Chigo, and he's a Basically, he's the personification of fate um, mm. and the fate that's dealt to you 
um, basically because of the protagonist's greed. He um, he steals some money that comes from a busted um, a drug bust, and um, he steals this money. So he the cartel hires him to basically track him down. And the story follows him evading this villain, and he's just so chilling and sadistic and cold-blooded and unsympathetic that I can't ever imagine um, someone being able to relate to him unless they're you know the same variety of person. Um, yeah, no, I don't think just... I don't think he's meant to be relatable. Like I think more for no. him, he's just he's meant to be freaking scary. Um, yeah. Landon, to give yeah. you some, to give you an example, so that you have like a little bit of context for this. The the main trope of this character is all about chance, right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm gonna flip mm -hmm. a coin, and that's gonna determine your fate. And I don't Absolutely. have anything to do with it. Like, yes, he and he's the killer and the evil one, but he tries to pretend that it's not about him, right? It's not about him. Fate is what got you, right? He's just the instrument okay. of fate. So that's yeah. that's what he's all about. Um, and he's oh god, he's wonderful. It's it's so that... really really good villain. That reminds me of a very, like, to relate it to another maybe more relatable uh, villain, Harvey Dent, or Two-Face oh. from the from the Batman series, where he had the coin of, of fate, basically, too. Yep. Um, okay, so that's a, that's a nice little trope in there that I really like. I like yeah. that. Yeah, he's definitely, but, like, a realistic kind of Harvey Dent-type character. You know, it's not, okay. it's not comic book. It's, like, it's very real, but it's that type yeah. of character. I feel like I love that. Thank you so much, much Lunar. We do um, we do love if you follow my Twitter. Um, that I do post like actual <laughs> content on there. It's not just reposts. So yeah, my following my Twitter would be great. <clears throat> Sorry, y'all go ahead. Um, but, yeah, I was I was just saying that uh, to me it makes it even he, he's even more scarier because um, he's realistic. You know, you, it could be your neighbor. It could be it could be anyone around you. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. He doesn't have any sort of supernatural element to him or anything like that. He's just a, just a dude, and he's just this absolute machine. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it just makes it even more scary for me because I mean, humans are monsters, you know, and that for me just it scares the hell out of me. Yeah, that's yeah, the real monster okay. was man all along, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, let's be honest that that kind of is how it is right the worst villains are those that are extremely human yep yeah. um and and really and i guess not relatable is not the word for that but but that it could be your neighbor or your boss or a stranger you meet on the street that of what is the human human capable of and that that reminds me of like the series westworld mm -hmm. um okay. very that. much <laughs> yeah very much uh kind of that same idea of of writing writing plots like that and writing villain characters that are that could happen that make but that genuine fear plausible that also reminds me of uh hannibal lecter because yeah. no, nobody knew he was what he was until um you know very late in the in the books in the show um and you know he was the din you know the, the, the dinner guest is the best way to describe <laughs> him i think and um again it's just no supernatural element about him and he's just this this absolutely just manipulative uh, charming villain okay yeah yeah no he he really is i mean i think i think Hannibal Lecter is definitely one of my top 10 villains um or bad guys i should say i like to refer to them as bad guys um villain just seems a lot. <laughs> a villain I mean, makes it seem like I shouldn't of like them. Hero at this point. It's kind of a yeah. Hero. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so far we've had some great examples. I want to get into Karen. You mentioned Cersei Lannister yeah. from Game of Thrones. Um, yeah. Tell me what you love about her as a as the villain of the series. I mean, she kind arguably, of is, right? She's yeah, like arguably, I I think she's the main. Arguably, I could say that there are. A lot of villains, um, and almost every character, except unless they, unless their last name is Stark, uh, <laughs> has a villainous streak at some point. Yeah. Um, um, but what did you love about Cersei? So Cersei, like I, I have a very deep, deep love of uh, of villain characters. Um, they're often the most um, complicated characters to me. They are often characters that are kind of othered right in some way mm -hmm. by the story or by the society or by the hero so of course that is you know that's very relatable 
right? As somebody that is kind of, um, you know, it, it tends to have more nerdy interests as someone that, um, you know, I, it's, it's rare that I see like uh, me specifically represented, right? So of course, you know, a very charismatic villain, that's something that's, that's very interesting and, and attractive to me. So when it comes to, to Cersei, that's what I really first loved about her is that she was unabashedly herself and she was not going to let anybody tell her what was okay and she was going to do her thing regardless right like she knew that the world was against her being a woman in her society but she was going to do what she wanted and i just i was instantly um interested in her relationship with jamie right with her brother mm -hmm. and yes. it was it was very clear in in the writing and in the storytelling that this was something that was to, that was supposed to be seen as um a physical manifestation of Cersei's narcissism, right? Of her, of like her flaw, right? Yeah. You know, she's only really interested in her twin, and uh, and she's really not interested in anybody else, uh, because that's yeah. the only person that's like even really close to being enough that's like that. her for her to care. <laughs> so, um, so to me, that's why, like, when when we started watching Game of Thrones, like, I instantly was like. Oh, she's one of my favorites because um, because I just I, I saw this like really uh, subversive kind of nature that she had and that the and the way that the character was crafted was like wearing their symbolism on their sleeve, which um, which, you know, I love all of that kind of stuff. So so that's what I that's what makes me like so interested in Cersei. Okay, so Bree says, I never correlated Camila and Cersei, but now listening to you talk about them, yeah, I can see it. <laughs> yeah, you know, that was going to be my next point. I was like, yep, that's Camilla. That's Camilla. Yep. She, she I have to watch this show. <laughs> she's going to do. She's, she's literally um, proving herself, proving that she's better than everyone around her, and they're all men, uh, apart from the protagonist, who, of course, is going to rise from rags to riches and prove that, you know, women run the show. Um, but yeah, they're, they're quite similar in that regard. Um, so it's pretty know. much just her and then the titular Queen of the South, right? And that's all the women in the show? Um, there are a couple of others, but they're the main, yeah, they're the main. Gotcha. Uh, and there's Camilla's husband, who is just an antagonistic force against her, uh, wants her to come home and be his, you know, housewife or number mm. two or whatever, but she's not interested in any of that. She's going to conquer the world. She can do what she wants to do. Um, and ultimately, it um, it ends up in well, I just spoil the show. So I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go on because I don't want to spoil it for you. Yeah, no spoilers. <laughs> um, because I think I yeah. do want to watch this. Um, I just actually finished watching, uh, watching Shira, and so I need a new show. Um, and I can actually take a moment. Are we still doing favorite villains? Is that still what we're on? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so I have another one I want to talk about. Um, I just finished watching the Shira reboot. I had waited all the way until it was over because honestly, like I was just scared off by the fandom. Like there's a bunch of people in that fandom that are just freaking ridiculous. So I waited all the way till it was over and I just watched it in one fell swoop. And then I don't even have to interact too much with the fandom. You know, the content's already there for me and it's all good. Um, so, but one of the main villains in that show, uh, Hordak, oh my God, I love him so much. So uh, to not get into spoilers, because it turns out it turns out that like there's other villains in the show. Right. So I don't want but we don't you don't see that until towards the end. Um, but uh, but he is he is somebody that is just trying his best to prove himself once again. And that's what really like instantly attracted me to him. Like he is doing his best to like lead this um, in, invasion uh, into the, the planet that the protagonists live on. Right. And, uh, and that's yeah. really like his driving force. And there's a lot against him. Um, there's a lot working against him, but, uh, but he tries his best to, to reach his goal. And so that's like another, uh, that's, that's, I think what I really at the core love about villains, because that's something both he and Cersei have in common is that they're just, they've, they've got like this goal. They've got like this, this thing that they're working for and they're going to do everything they can to get there like consequences be damned get out of their way you know what i mean mm. um so, so like I, the unexpected so, kind of villain yeah yeah so yeah. it almost sounds like that there are two that we have discussed so far and we we have plenty of time to go and dig into deeper and more villains but we have mm -hmm. two very different kinds of villains we have the villains that have something to prove like the cersei's and camilla of the worlds mm -hmm. um and then we have the 
could be anybody next door neighbor in hiding sort of villain villain like the Hannibal Lecters and um we discussed another one but the so it sounds like for old men yeah the Anton that was his name yes um that we have these two very distinct types of villains that fall into these two categories do can you guys think of any examples of villains that fit maybe outside those categories or if there's another sort of category that we're not thinking about yeah i have an example of another kind of villain i really like and this is so cheesy in anime but whatever fuck it i love it Um, we love it go villains (laughs) villains that eventually get like a redemption arc and then they become kind of like you know the friend or the weird uncle of the protagonists like okay like vegeta from dragon ball z right like he's so bad like he does so many bad things but by the end he's one of the he's one of the guys right and vegeta was one of the first characters that i really fell in love with in any sort of show or movie or anything um so yeah villains like that freaking love and i know there's other examples um so if y'all think of other examples like let's talk about them too give me a in my top five oh go he's actually kind of he does get a sort of a redemption arc in the second movie um brie's gonna know who i'm talking about now because I made her watch this as well, and she became upset. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, you should have watched Sicario um, if you haven't seen it. Have you? Have you seen it? No. No. No, I haven't seen that. Right. Yeah, I... Regina Mills. Regina Mills is a really good example of this. Brie. Yeah, I totally Ooh. agree. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so his name is Alejandro, and he's a Colombian hitman hired by the CIA uh, to basically take on Mexican drug cartels. Mm. Um, and this all. Um, sort of came to light because his family were killed by the cartels. Oh, um, it's a bit ambiguous as to who exactly killed them uh, in the second movie. I won't give you any spoilers, but um, basically, he's the pers- personification of wrath in the first movie. He ah. is going to get these cartels down because they killed his family, no matter what. Um, motivated by revenge, um, and you kind of want him to succeed when you find out that he's the you know, he's driven by, you know, the personal loss. But in the second movie, um, he is tasked with kidnapping a young girl. Mm. And it kind of puts him in the headspace of his kidnap- uh, the kidnappers that kidnapped his daughter. And he's kind of reliving out that trauma. And it kind of sort of spins his head a little bit. And he becomes this protective figure to this young girl. Uh, so he can't he go of through with it. Sorry? He can't go through with it, right? Like, he yeah, has to protect he, her instead. Exactly. He's ordered to... I love it. Uh, ...do away with her, and he, he can't do it. Um, so the movie is basically him getting her to safety, back to her. Um, and it's just it's just fantastic, so you should watch. Sounds really I good. Think, I think the idea of a redemption arc is such a wonderful, like, thing to play. Like, yeah. as a writer, I love a good redemption arc. I can't think of a time that I've actually done a redemption arc, but I <laughs> love them. <laughs> well, we, were, we were working on it. We were working, we were working on, on one. Before, but... <laughs> well, because, you know, r- role plays a little bit different, right? Like sometimes you just have to end them because everyone else is bored. So and redemption arcs take a lot of freaking work, like a lot of freaking work. Well, I think that's because w- in order to satisfy yourself as a writer and uh, the other people involved as readers, you have to first of all, there's like so many good steps, right? You have to make a convincing villain that people are actively invested in. If it's someone that that people don't care about, then they're not going to care about the redemption arc of it all. Yep. And then you have to do like a realistic transfer of redemption. um, And what does that look like? And what is involved in that? And then you have to make them a likable good guy while also still retaining the same characteristics yeah. as a villain yes yeah, so as they what they had like, as a villain a totally different person yeah because you 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 can't have like they still have all of the history and baggage and and trauma and and character development that they had before it's just that they've had even more yeah and so being able yeah, to successfully because, write that in a satisfying thing up, uh, yeah yeah exactly you know, love does a lot but it, you know it's not going to cure some of the you know the issues that made them the villain in the first place Right. It's, cure it, it's gonna help the development. It's gonna aid the development, but it's not going to cure it. Yeah. And think about how long that sort of that sort of change inside of a person takes place in real life. Mm-hmm. And yes, yeah. like you know, there is there is fiction time, so 
things are typically faster happening within the realms of movies and TV shows and books, but you still yeah. have to have a realistic amount of time. Someone sitting there and going, I want the world to be destroyed. And then all of a sudden, Hey, I'm on the good guys team and it's been two weeks is not an arc that is actually like playable. Yeah. Or it's not a redemption arc. You yep. can suspend your belief for a certain amount of time, yeah. but it's not, it's not going to be overnight. But for, for like, shifting shifting allegiances takes a lot and so it just and shifting worldview takes a lot too so being able to pull that off is a very difficult thing uh that i love i just haven't done it yet <laughs> <laughs> well because i think in if you think about it realistically like we can have big moments but I, I think in reality when you have somebody changing their worldview it's like a piece by piece process right like it doesn't happen overnight maybe there is one event that sort of kicks it off right and that's a great story moment but it's not going to be something where it's like you know um all of the time it, it, where that one event and then all of a sudden they're different like that's not real like that usually once that person changes they still have baggage and they still have tendencies left over from what they were like beforehand Right. Like, so I'll give a good example of this. Um, and this this goes into kind of the a little bit of the poor writing in the show that that happens. But um, Crowley and Supernatural, um, he has mm, sort of baby. a redemption. Right. He has sort of a redemption. Right. And becomes kind of friends with the Winchesters. But then, like, they constantly get surprised when he goes back to, you know, being a demon and does demon things and goes against them. And it's like, dude, wh like, why are you surprised? Why are you still trusting him just because he's nice to you sometimes? Stop it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> How do you get this game on PC? Oh, so if you want to get this game on PC, go to the Viva Pinata subreddit. They have a whole bunch of um, articles and things like that that will help you get this game working on PC. There was an official PC version, but it was on Games for Windows Live, which does not work anymore. <laughs> so if you want to play this game on PC, there's a couple other things that you have to do after you get it, but the stuff on that subreddit will walk you through it. So go, go check out their pinned resources there. I very quickly just wanted to touch on the, and I kind of touched on it earlier, but how the villain has transformed within stories from like how they were originally, like, like I look at it comic books or these villains that just want to do chaos and destroy things. And there is no personality behind them other than the fact that they are villains to how we now, you know, 20 years later, are really connected to the that villain story. Um, have you guys noticed anything like that? Like that change in how villains are portrayed over time? Yeah, I do think that like a modern, in a modern interpretation, we want like every character, even if you don't learn it, like even if you don't learn it in the story, you want every character to have some kind of backstory. Um, I do think that there's still a lot of value to be had in like villains just for the sake of, you know, villainy and you don't ever get to learn anything about them. And those are great characters, but I think that a lot of readers really expect to understand why a villain is doing villainous things. And as soon as you add that why in, all of a sudden now there's sympathy there, right? As soon as you know what that why is, all of a sudden you're like, oh, I see how they did that. I maybe could end up doing the bad thing too. And I think that that's shifted a lot and, and even more so like as, as there's more push for like everybody has a backstory, um, we get that more and more and more the blurring of a line of what's actually a villain and what's not. I think as well, because nowadays TV is so popular, they yep. have more time to do that. You can dig into villain backgrounds um, and we want that, you know, we'll consume that happily. Um, so I think that was a big uh, reason why these days you have that shift where you can really look into a uh, a villain's psyche into the background you know what happened to make them the way they are today yeah it's much harder to do in a, in a movie format right because in a yeah. movie you have like two hours max i mean every some we have some movies that are a little bit longer right but basically two hours max and uh, and then it's done so you only have so much time so you have to tell these really concise stories but in a tv yeah. show you sometimes get seasons upon seasons upon seasons so you can like go into all this great stuff um, Brie has a good example. Maleficent was essentially a villain when you look back through the lore, but nowadays with the Angelina Jolie, so that's the the Disney the remake that they did. Um, she now has a lot more heart and reasoning with in modern day adaptions. And yeah, I think that that we see that a lot. Like we we want that. Um, you know, we want to know like why, even if the original story doesn't have it, we'll add it in a lot of times. Yeah, um, and I think that's also paved the way to being able to do 
anti-heroes. I know this is a little, it's it's edging on the idea of heroes and stuff like that, and this is going to be strictly villains. But that idea of having a gray character also be good, and like, what is the real definition of a villain at this point in time? Yeah. Yep. Like, and like the Punisher, the Punisher comes to mind. When we yes. yes. Deadpool being another one. I know he's more hero than necessarily a villain, but being willing to do bad things, really proving that like, the idea that villains don't think that they are the villains, right? They're what yep. makes I think an important thing that makes a good villain is that they don't think they're doing the bad thing. They think they're justified in their actions. Yep. Because that's reality. That's like nobody that <laughs> thinks they're a villain. Nobody. No. No. Exactly. Um, so I think that that's something that because of that transformation and being able to do things like take Maleficent's side of the story, who is traditionally a villain and make her more gray i wouldn't necessarily consider her a protagonist she is in of course her thing but i wouldn't consider her a hero in her story because she's still you know morally you know cursed a child to die yeah, she still does but... bad things right <laughs> some really bad things <laughs> some some pretty terrible things um brie says i think it's interesting to get a villain who is just a villain as we use or who's just as a villain as we used to and that they're evil without a backstory or something that leads up to the why but sometimes it's not realistic and we as people crave the re relatability they are now offering us yep i think we absolutely do i think we yeah. really do crave it and we really do expect it and i and i think that this is really evident in um, a lot of fan works like i think when you do have stories with irredeemable villains it's almost like you're guaranteeing someone's going to go on ao3 and write their own <laughs> redemption arc for this character right like are like, you you're pretty much guaranteeing you, that i feel like are you talking about loki I mean, <laughs> like, are you just shouting I loki mean, out on this one i mean you pretty much could right like you pretty much could just say loki right <laughs> um yeah that also kind of reminds me of uh of one of my favorite villains who I, who I didn't say is, um, oh my God, why am I forgetting his name from the walking dead? Oh, Negan. 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 Oh, I'm just I terrible at names. Negan. <laughs> of course it's going to be Negan. It's Negan because I literally too. just binge watched the entirety of the walking dead over the course of like a month. Oh, it's wow. not healthy, but I did it. Yeah. You're um, like, what? <laughs> I literally I was talking to Naomi about it and I was like I'm playing a Jeffrey Dean Morgan character currently I really need to understand this this villain and I know I need the context of the story so I guess I'll just watch the whole thing turns out Negan doesn't come in till season seven um, <laughs> surprise <laughs> But yeah, uh, Negan being able to like, it, there's so much crave for that like background and that it's, he's another character that we, that he was kind of just at first evil for the sake of being evil. And then as fans fell in love with him, the writers finally gave him somewhat of a backstory and also now a redemption arc. Mm -hmm. yeah. So they're doing it right, I guess. And I think that that's so, like, going back to what Naomi said about TV, that's so much easier to do in television, right? Because yes. you can you can basically, you can release a season, and then you can look at what the fan feedback is, and then you can craft something that's based off of that, right? Um, that you're, like, that, that you're wanting to, you know, if the fans really like this character, it's like, okay, well, how do we keep this character around? How do we keep it going? Um, and it almost feels like in a way that television is is working in in the in the writers' minds, right? In the producers' minds, it's almost doing a lot of the same functions that we do in role play, right? Where we just kind of set things up, and then it's like we have sort of a plan, but um, but plans are for losers, and uh, and they'll change <laughs> based on what everyone's responding to and what everyone starts to enjoy, right? <laughs> and I feel like television a lot of times works the same way. Well, yeah. I mean, and we can also let's. I think television works the same way very much so, but I also think it can ruin really great villain characters. Oh, it can. Uh, let's let's see if we can guess who I'm talking about. Oh my gosh. Um, <laughs> his <laughs> his name is Klaus Michelson. Um, <laughs> Of the it's fact so that... sad that they never got to do the final season of um, the original. So so sad. Um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah. We don't talk about it. Mm -mm. Nope. No, it's well, I mean, it never happened. So <laughs> anyway, um, yeah, being able to have that long, that long form time to tell a story to tell a story over time, right? Books yep. nor movies can do that. 
uh, because you either in movies you lose a lot of detail and within books that's so much reading yeah um, and so much writing so tv shows have a ability to tell a elongated story over time that allows for depth and discussion about villains um, that is able to then change because of what the fans want or even what's what's going on in the world how many tv shows have taken especially like Grey's Anatomy and stuff like that have taken real life ideas of what is happening in the real life to then uh, apply it to their tv show to make it more relatable but I think when it comes to villains it really destroys them <laughs> it really can I think you're absolutely right with that it totally can um which is unfortunate but yep. you know what? That's what it is. Well, and that's and that's I, and I think that kind of goes to like the our, our mode of production, right? And when it comes to these these works and um, and television and things like that, is that it's beholden to making money, right? Like at the end of the day, it has to make money. So sometimes I think that these these shows and uh, they'll do things that that they think the fans want to see, but fans don't always know what they want. Like let's be real, fans don't always know what they want. <laughs> um, you know, they 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 don't. And, uh, and so they'll do things that were not really in the best interest of the story, and it's a balancing act, right? Because you can't yeah. make something that, that's like your vision, but then the fans hate it. Um, cough, cough, Game of Thrones, right? But, <laughs> um, but you can, but I think that, that there, is, there is a balance there of like when to listen to fans and when not to. And I think that for a lot of um, creatives that are working in that space, that's like the current norm, right? When you can get instant and direct fan feedback through things like Twitter, like you have to have a keen eye about like, what exactly is the person asking for versus what they really want versus what your vision is for um, what you, you're producing. Yeah, exactly. Um, I think it's, I, I, as much as we say like that as role players, we, we like, we write like a TV show and we've always joked that like our RPs would be great TV shows. Um, yeah, great, fan, CW, but... great CW shows because they're all just soap operas, right? They're all soap <laughs> operas, teen soap operas. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. I mean, I... The, 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 uh, the one I've got going on with Brie at the moment, um, we've been doing it for the last seven years. Seven. You know, we want to see the TV show. Yeah. We should write it one of these days. But the problem is, is that it, it opens that same thing up that all of a sudden the thing that's beautiful about role playing is that you're really writing for, <laughs> as Karen likes to say, an audience of one. Yeah, one person. So, uh, yeah, one person, and then all of a sudden, when you write a TV show, yeah, yeah, you are you are now responsible for the fans as well and writing it to please them as much. So yeah, it kind of come. It, it's not your own anymore. It, become, it gets a life its own sort of thing. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It, really it really does. All right. So, what are we? We've discussed some of the villains that we really like and have in have seen. Um, and we've kind of hinted along their characteristics, but what are some of the absolute characteristics that makes the ultimate villain that you think every villain, like if you had to make a villain potion, <laughs> what is going in that villain potion? Ooh. Oh, I have to think about this. If y'all have answers first, um, go for it. I have to, I, have to, I need a little bit of thought. I think drive. Drive. Yeah. 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 Which isn't necessarily a bad thing. But, you know, well, I like to I think it's drive, but it's also kind of a ch like I like the something to prove that we talked about with Cersei and, and Camilla and, and some other villains that we've spoken about today. And that that's something to prove like Thanos comes to mind that he mm -hmm. that he has this goal in mind and he has something to prove. And so he is going to do everything he can to prove that goal. Um, so so a chip on his shoulder almost, too. Yeah. I yeah, think another yeah. thing is is willingness to conflict. Like it's impossible in my mind. I mean, maybe someone has done a good one, but I've never seen one I liked. So it's impossible in my mind to have a villain that is averse to conflict, right? Like you got to be willing to get your hands dirty. You got to be willing. The character has to be willing to like say, okay, well, this this is doesn't fit my morals, but m my goal is so much more important than my morals that I'm going to do it anyway, right? Or they're willing to do yeah. the mental gymnastics to justify their actions or um, yeah. things I like that. I like the way that you put it as far as justifying their actions, that they're willing to bend morale, the, the idea, the like society morality, not necessarily their own morality in terms to finish their goal. Yep. Um, that they're willing to, to do things like kill people or, you know, take the, take the, uh, the harder route and the more severe route. Yep. 
Were you going to say something, Naomi? No, no. It was just oh, listening. okay. Sorry. I thought I cut you off. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so I agree. I agree with that as well. Um, I also think that having... I think that when you're writing a villain, you have to write them with the sense that they are not going to be liked. Now, I think that it could be part of their character to be liked by the mass, but also knowing that, like, this is kind of a conflict thing, but the protagonist is supposed to go against them, and that protagonist at some point is not going to be, is not going to like them. Um, so they have to be okay with that. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's a that's a good that's a good thing to remember. Like your other characters in the story kind of can't like them. <laughs> yeah. Uh if well, everybody some, likes the villain, they're not really much of a villain. Before the before the villain, you know, is sort of um, revealed. Revealed, yeah. Yeah. I I agree and I think that's something that we will obviously we will probably t discuss in depth on in a, in a few minutes when we talk about challenges of playing a villain. Um that that before that reveal happens um yeah. but also being aware as the writer and the creator of a character that that reveal is going to happen and at some point people it doesn't have to be everybody but people are going to dislike your character that character yeah. yeah or that is the purpose of it and it's great if it happened you know it's oh it's, it's the best it's i <laughs> i love it when the it's entire so chat funny. hates <laughs> Yeah, I love it when the entire chat hates the, your character. It's the best feeling in the world. <laughs> I sense a tiny bit of sarcasm there. <laughs> no, actually, I, I want to say that like if I can successfully make people go, oh my fucking god, are you kidding me? Or, oh my god, I can't believe he did that. I, I feel like I've I've succeeded as a villain. Mm -hmm. um, but it also kind of sucks too when, when it's continued to be ragged on by that, but <laughs> um that'll we'll discuss that i think more in depth when we start talking about playing a villain right now we're just trying to yeah what is the yeah. archetypes of villains yeah. yeah um so when i think about like when i think about like my when i think about my favorite villains like something i touched on before but um but something that always draws me to them is is that subversive nature right like i think that i think that when it comes to villains as as a writer you get a little bit more freedom to make them um outside the norm right um whereas yeah. when you're making a character that's supposed to be liked by everyone there's like this pressure to uh to make them conform to to societal norms and things like that and sometimes it's just like i don't really want to write a, you know another one of those kind of characters that are a dime a dozen right like i want to write the character that's out there that's weird that has you know deviant interests and things like that and um and it's so much easier to put that into a villain, I feel like, which isn't super fair, right? That isn't super yeah. fair, like, but um, but that's the reality of it, and, and that's what ends up being um, accepted by readers. So yeah, so that's it's something that, else um, that I think really is appealing to uh, to villain characters. Right. Yeah. The the personal agency that they get is just you know so much more unhindered than the yeah. hero, and that that's what draws me into playing villains. Yep. Um, you know, it's that freedom to do what they want um obviously the consequences to those actions but it's it's very interesting <laughs> all right so very quickly before we we expand on that um how does a villain fall into a story like obviously we have traditionally you have um a protagonist and antagonist but when we're talking about role play there are so many more protagonists and antagonists within that dynamic how how does a villain fall into that dynamic so i feel like there's you kind of when you're crafting a villain for for role play and you're trying to build that dynamic it's really important to look first at what everyone else is doing and look at what the overall plot of the role play is is intended to be right and that's where i think the villain comes from like if you're if the okay. goal of the role play is you know like in in magic reborn right the the kind of goal of that role play was to protect their little town from all these outside forces that keep you know coming in to hurt them right so what that means is that uh that your villain is now not interested in that right like maybe they're interested in bringing in outside forces maybe they are an outside force themselves trying to to you know come in you know sneaky like right so i think it 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 starts from it starts from whatever the goal is and then builds out from there. 
Okay, so that it's it's it very important. So almost a villain is secondary, almost like that. You have to have what is the base of the story before you can have how to destroy that in a way. I feel like yes, um, Naomi. I think you're about to kind of expand on what I was saying too. Um, oh, so if you could jump yeah, in. Yeah, I think it depends. I think it depends on the story that you want to tell because you can use your villain as a tool to get there. Hmm. Okay. I like I like that perspective. I think I agree with that. I think that the villain, like the protagonists or or the good guys, would be is just as important to the story. Like without conflict, at least in our RPs, there wouldn't be story. Yeah. Um. There wouldn't be something to tell. There wouldn't be a greater a greater goal to aim for. Yeah, I mean, the hero needs you know someone to um, antagonize them essentially for there to be. Something I think it's to follow. Uh, you know, it depends on the, obviously the genre and the story that you're telling. But yeah, I think it's also very interesting that within RP, um, at least in at least in my experience that I'm like thinking of, except for L O O H, um, and and arguably now in our current RP, that there are typically multiple heroes and typically one villain. Yeah. Yeah, typically. Which is, which is just very, I think, fascinating as far as story goes. Um, not necessarily, like, not currently, not currently in Atlantis, I feel like, because I feel like there's a difference between warring tribes and someone trying to destroy the status quo. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think that Atlantis that we're doing right now was purpose-built for us to play villains a bit more, right? But that's yeah. not always what we've done. And whenever we don't explicitly build something like that, what we end up with is a few villains and mostly the people wanting to play good guys. Um, and I, I, I have some I have some theories about why that happens because I don't think that's just us. I think that's role play in general. But um, but I don't know if I am I jumping the gun if I if I say why. No. Nope. Are we gonna get to, go okay. ahead and go so, ahead, tell me? I think that that comes from people in role play generally being conflict averse with their characters and i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing i do think that a lot a lot of role play to be successful in it you have to make a character that's likable um over anything else because at the end of the day you got to get interactions right if your characters can't sit in a room and talk to other characters it's not role play's not happening right role play's not happening <laughs> so there's certain limitations on what you can do with villains because you have to have a character that's willing to just sit down and have a normal conversation with another character like that's required if your character can't do that they cannot they cannot engage in the role play right <laughs> so i think it's that, true yeah so i think that that what that turns into is a lot of role players have these various experiences um in regard to how they role play and how it's built up and things like that and what that ends up turning into is that over the over time role players become more and more conflict averse because what they find is what actually works to get role play is to make a nice character that doesn't want to hurt anybody that's just chill and does you know does their own thing and and it kind of <laughs> It kind of makes it so that sometimes people go too far, right? And they end up with a super passive, boring character. I don't think most people do that. But I think what most people realize is that if they want to have lots of role play interactions and and in, in and engage with it a lot, then they kind of they they can't play a villain. Um, and at the end of the day, they just don't want to put in a huge the huge amount of effort that it would take to to play a villain in role play. Right, because it does take more effort to play that character it does. It does. that can't think... as easily just sit in a room and chat with somebody. Yeah. What were I you think saying? It does take more, um, more experience to. Yes. Maybe. Okay, to to play a less flat villain, uh, a villain with a successful arc. I think it's also easier to join as a hero or as a good guy because playing a villain means you have to plot you have to reach out to people you, you know nobody's gonna hand you these plots that you, you know, gotta do the work me. well <laughs> maybe landon will but <laughs> <laughs> maybe but most people um, won't right most people won't most people yeah. uh won't engage with you because they're like i don't want my character to get hurt i don't know yeah. what if what if we end up doing something that has consequences that i can't get out of you know interacting with the villain character takes away some of their choice as the role player so um so it can be a challenge so you have to be the one to reach out to people ultimately yeah and it's also I, easier to join as a hero 
the guy because it, I think it takes an amount of trust in the people that you are role yeah. playing with to be able to play a villain. Um, and if you don't know the people that you're starting out to role play with, I think that you know it's just abundantly easier to to join as a good guy or someone that's that maybe be neutral. Mm-hmm. I totally agree. I agree. Like if I'm joining a new group, I'm not gonna bring a character that tends to be more of a villain. I'm just not because I don't know these people. I don't know what their limits are. <laughs> I don't know what's gonna yeah. freak them out. Um, I don't know what's going to cause conflict. What's gonna make people like upset, like out of character upset. Like I can, I don't care about upsetting your characters. Like that's part of the that's yeah. part of the game, right? But I just don't know. Like I don't know them like that. So yeah. I'm not gonna and... I'm not gonna do that. I'm not gonna bring a villain until like until I've really gotten to know this group of people. And this is why I don't RP anywhere else, but in our group. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> because um, I. <laughs> with what we're doing now with Atlantis it's basically a license to be bad yes you know, if you don't read the synopsis the plot and think okay I'm gonna make a villain then it's not for you yeah um, I think that um, we are the exception to that in a sense that okay you don't have to be the biggest villain of the group but uh, you know come in you know you meet us you talk to us and we'll encourage you to be bad yep that's basically that you know Bree says me with joining groups yeah big mood right (laughs) um i you get used to you get used to the people that you're playing with right and then it becomes a challenge to play with other people because it's like oh i've spent all this time learning what your limits and boundaries are and now i have to learn this whole new set of limits and boundaries and it's like who wants to do all that (laughs) it does help though that you have that channel list your your triggers and your squicks yeah Uh, yeah Bree, I am on the same page with you. Bree says, because I prefer to write villains over good guys generally. Yeah. I am, I love me a villain. She's, <laughs> I, she's it, great at them too, you know. She writes a cracking villain, I would say. Thank you. Um, Bree! <laughs> uh, yeah, no, Bree, or sorry, uh, villains are, are wonderful characters to play. And I think it's because of things that both uh, Naomi and Karen have said earlier, as far as that it takes a lot more work and to make a villain than it does necessarily a good guy. And because of that, there's a lot more depth to those characters. Uh, not saying that all lighthearted good characters are, are not deep, but because of that extra work, there's a lot yeah. more depth that I enjoy that depth. Because I think it's easier to uh, relate with the, the good guy because I don't know, personally, you know, default, my, my default is, you know, to be good. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I don't, I don't want to, you know, murder people or you know eat people or, you know all that stuff all that fun stuff that i do on my in my free time but <laughs> it takes only when they don't wear a mask <laughs> <laughs> it takes it takes work to, to you know to understand where a person has to to get in their life to, to, to be like that yeah um, you have to really dig into the, like okay if this person's morality doesn't align with mine where is their morality set? What has made it that their morality is at this level? Um, how did it get there? What are their morals? Like you have to think of all those things. Whereas when you have a hero or a neutral, that morality is already kind of naturally aligned with what you think is okay and what you believe is good. Yeah, it um, conforms with you know society. You know what society is telling you. You know you need to be. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I think that I think I think that's a huge reason as to why people write villains. I uh, just to say getting back to like the idea of going into a new group or having people come into a group, especially it is my favorite thing sometimes during Atlantis to just see a new person come in and then <laughs> Naomi and I are in the middle of a twin scene (laughs) and we're just like let's test it let's see how long they're gonna last because really this is fun (laughs) and you never know right and you never know and you never know i think it was uh jane and she was like those are the twins i told you about (laughs) yeah that was that was fantastic (laughs) what do i did i miss something we joined her role play as the twins. Oh, so they had a reputation over there, and then when she joined, someone else joined with her. She went, "Those are the twins." those are the twins atlantis is always accepting apps brie and you know and this actually goes out to summer too so i know summer you're busy right now but hopefully you'll watch this later on the vod um on youtube or something 
but uh or on the podcast yeah we are on the, on the podcast right because it's going to be on spotify and stuff too but yeah, yeah atlantis is accepting apps um you know if you if you guys are kind of if people listening are kind of feeling what we're talking about and you're like gosh i really do want a place to play villains um you know we have a we have a we have a role play that's purpose built for that so if that interests you and um and you want to play villains you know out of out of out of that and you know now i would say that out of character we don't support a lot of this kind of stuff right so if you're there because you're like i like being a troll like that's it's not for you it's not for you like if you if you want an excuse to be mean because you wish you could be mean in real life it's not for you right but if you enjoy these types of characters and you enjoy writing these types of characters with a group of people that's not gonna get easily squicked out by a lot of stuff atlantis might be for you come check us out in fact, I'm gonna I'm gonna up that ante and go. I dare you. Like, there's a lot of things happening in Atlantis <laughs> that I'd be like, if you think this is just the place to go wild, right? Atlantis is. I yeah. I genuinely believe that as long as it's not trolly, as long as it's serious, as long as it's a believable villain character, we're gonna sit there and gonna be like, yeah, no, keep going. Let's yeah, see how yeah. far you can take this. We're fine with it. Yeah. <laughs> It's basically a gangster's paradise. I've been saying this since day one. It literally that is. Literally is. That is the tagline. Yes. Yep. Um. Yeah. So I think I think that that is the fun thing. Oh, Bree said something. I just get so nervous joining groups. I tend to hesitate. But Naomi has talked a lot about it, and it sounds so cool. I'd love another place to write in an atmosphere like this. Listen, we we're super chill. Um. And, and Karen has discussed this in her videos a lot that we're all adults uh, within Atlantis. We have several single parents. We have or several parents in general. We have college students. We have people with full-time jobs. We have people who have an array of all three of those things. <laughs> so really, it's a super chill place with no pressure that's super judgmental and really warm and welcoming. Uh, everyone, we form a community. And I think that's what makes an RP group so important so yeah. please join us Brie <laughs> and I think at this point with the way that we've grown and you know how old some of us are that have been in this group for a long time I can't see us ever going back to something that's more of like you know a PG or even a PG-13 rating like even if we make yeah. um even if we make a chiller RP next that that isn't like villains gone wild right um I, I suspect that we'll still be an 18 plus space that is open yeah. to people exploring you know whatever kind of craziness they want to explore well our median age is somewhere like 30 right it's like 28 yeah. 20 30 it's between 28 and 30 i think so um, yeah i think i'm one of the i'm 26 and i think i'm i think thumper is younger than me i think there's one person younger than me i think you're right and everyone else <laughs> is older than that like like we're all we're all adults <laughs> we're not like 18 and playing adult. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> oh so yeah brie it's a great chance to get back into it if you want to mm -hmm. so i think that's kind of the end of the they're like the end result is come join us because yeah. i dare you to um <laughs> uh yeah so let's get into us playing villains uh okay. Okay, when we kind of been talking about that anyway, but we have all played villains to different sort of villains, whether it be the ones with the chip on the shoulder, whether it be the ones that just kind of want world domination, whether it be the ones that are, you know, goblins. I'm looking at you for damn <laughs> and Naomi. <laughs> um, he's an angel, okay? Oh my god, he's literally the worst. But whatever, you, the whatever opposite, he makes you feel better. <laughs> if you if you read by angel, the worst thing ever. Hey, then Lucifer yes. was an angel, okay? I'll say that. <laughs> um, Lucifer was an angel, <laughs> yes. Therefore, damn is is Lucifer. Um, um sure, yeah, okay. <laughs> But I, what is some advice when, when you're going to tell a newbie how to write a villain? We've already talked about like, you need depth and everything like that. And that, it, and that you need a little bit of a thick skin and that it takes a little bit of time. But is there any other advice that you would say about writing a villain and, and the story arc of one? 
I really think that like the the having a thick skin really is like my main piece of advice. Like when I see people want to, they try to play a villain and then they fail. This is what happens. They get so worried about like, oh well, what does this mean for me as a person? Does this mean I'm a bad person? Oh no, so this this person's mad at my character. Ah, this hurts that someone's mad at something I did. You know, um, that's where I really think a lot of people get tripped up is is they realize okay they realize on a fundamental level okay to play a villain i gotta have my character do bad things but then when they do it like the feeling that they have inside about how like that could potentially hurt people or that could like reflect on their personal morals in some way is like really it's really deep and it's really difficult for a lot of people to get past so i just want to say this for anybody that has that feeling it doesn't matter what you write it doesn't matter how bad what you write is it has nothing to do in that way with your personal morals the relationship between your personal morals and what you enjoy writing is nuanced and complex it is not one-to-one -one. enjoying writing bad things has very little to do with what your morals are as a person um once you pretty much reach the age of like i don't know 15 16 or so because at that point you can separate fiction from reality right like little kids can't little kids can't that's why that's why on a on a oh. child's oh hey hey on cue um so, you know, that's why, like, when you watch a TV show uh, that's that's like on a kid's channel and it says things like, oh, you know, commercial break now, like it announces it. That's why it does that, because at a certain age, you can't tell fiction from reality. But once you're a teenager and, a, and an adult, you pretty much can. So unless yeah. unless you personally know you do not have a good sense of that, you're not a bad person for writing a character doing bad things. And if someone gets upset with you for that, to me, like that is on them. That is on them for not having a good relationship with fiction versus reality. You know what I mean? Hey. Yep, I... <laughs> it's the baby. I agree. Writing something is not condoning something. Yeah. So if you're writing about murder or mayhem, you you yourself do not want to go out and murder and mayhem God, unless not. they're not wearing masks. <laughs> um, <laughs> just need to be clear on that and in the united states i should i should clarify that too yeah sorry we're talking about uh, the covid situation in the u.s when we say that just to be clear yes, that whole thing's a little bit angering for us so that's that's what that's about <laughs> anyway um i think that yeah you i think that there is this idea especially with the idea of tumblr like when tumblr got taken over by um Oh my god, aunties. what are they called? Aunties. aunties. Yeah. Uh, when when they when Tumblr got taken over with aunties as far as this like idea that if you are writing something or even thinking something, you are a terrible human being. And that's not how that works. It's more Your complicated brain... than that. It's more complicated. Oh hey Summer, I'm so glad you could join yeah. us. <laughs> um Yeah, hi Summer. But it's it's not any more complicated oh. than that. And wanting to explore things wanting to write things out it doesn't make you a terrible human being also it, it, it can be cathartic as well in your own life you know, it's yeah, space yeah. To, to explore these things that you can't in your everyday life that you know it also may mean a lot to you to explore um i know from from my own experiences um, <laughs> you know with, with like you know i lost my dad last year yeah it, you know it's a place where you can you know successfully get some things out you know and, and do well, some like, things yeah I mean I think we always there's there's this idea that we encourage people to put their emotions into their art things like happiness and sadness and but we don't necessarily with anger and the idea of aunties being angry at people wanting to express that those emotions within their art is backwards because people that's how people write <laughs> It really so. is. Yeah, exactly. And yeah. and I think that what Naomi talked about, you know, just this moment ago with, you know, mental help for herself with losing her father and things like that. Um, you know, art therapy is valid. It's valid yep. to, to say, like, you know, I'm really hurting right now. And uh, and so I'm going to explore that through art. And, and that's something that even that works for a lot of people that, that therapists will actually tell you to, to try out as a therapy method, um, you know, to bring it back to Landon's favorite thing, right? <laughs> um, you love therapy. And I, and I just yeah. wish I just wish that we in fandom would like would give people the benefit of the doubt, like when you see somebody writing something or role playing something, 
that's obviously bad that we would give people the benefit of the doubt and assume that like they know it's bad and i feel like we don't i feel like we assume the opposite like we assume that they don't know that what they're writing is bad but i i I would like to see a paradigm shift where we first assume that they know and then if we get evidence later that they they don't know then we take the actions that we need to take right yeah. but i think we should be giving people the benefit of the doubt and assume that they've done the work that they're not like that just because they they wrote this bad thing means that they um condone this bad thing in reality i agree i also think it's extremely important while discussing this to also be aware of your own boundaries that there are okay that it is okay to also when exploring this side not like to be squicked out and to have hard limits on certain writing things if you do not want to write non-con that is completely acceptable yeah you, you don't have it doesn't have to be all or nothing when writing a villain it is and it is a process it is that experience it is sitting there and being like okay let's start writing a little bit evil and if you reach a brick wall that you don't want to write or go down that is perfectly okay yeah, there's nothing wrong with that. I mean, and the only, and at least for me, and I think this is this is a pretty normal experience, a lot of times you don't know a limit or a squick exists until you reach it. Like, you don't know until you start writing it and, you, and you're like, I just can't handle it, right? Like, yeah, it, yeah. it takes that having that experience of trying to know if it's for you or not. Um, exactly and so i think when it comes to villains it it, it's it's it is good kind of like what you're what you're alluding to there is to take it slow like you don't need to write the biggest baddest most evil person out the gate like it's okay to you know kind of dip your toe in maybe you maybe you write an anti-hero for a while and you get used to that maybe you, you write somebody that does this bad thing but you're not like super you're not super like um it's not super personal for you, right? And you get used to that. And you can kind of build up into writing things that are that are more related to stuff that you deal with or things that are traumatic for you or things that are difficult for you, right? Like you don't have to come out the gate being like, oh, I'm gonna work through this emotion instantly and it's gonna all be good. Because at the end of the day, role play is not just you, right? It's your partner too, it's your partner too. So it's a much more intimate activity than solo writing. And, uh, and and that means that sometimes we do have to go a little bit more slowly if we've not done this sort of thing before. Yep. And that also means communicating with your partner if you get to a point where you're uncomfortable. Um, but also not judging that partner for crossing your limit. Yeah. Uh, I, I think hopefully that's something they that didn't also know. happens. Right? Like, hopefully they didn't know. Hopefully nobody's crossing your limits on purpose. Like, my God, if somebody does yeah. that to you in my role play, like, please tell me. Like, that should not be happening. You know there's what I mean? A different, yeah, <laughs> I mean, there's a difference you, between... If your role play is landing, she'll just ask you to do it. <laughs> Just yeah. it. I'll be like, just get the eyes, just do it. <laughs> just keep no, just keep going. I'll just deal with it. <laughs> this is oh why God. I'm in therapy. It's fine. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, I think that is that that brings up an important thing is for communication. You need to communicate with your partner, and that's part of part of being a villain. Because I also think part of these really dark storylines that villains that you can write as villains that you can't necessarily write as heroes is all about checking in and communication and seeing where everyone's at too yeah Uh, which sounds i don't know if it sounds silly it sounds a little silly saying it but it's not silly like it you need to be aware of where everyone's at when writing really intense stuff yeah yeah yeah, you need to keep those communication lines open so that if the other person does start to feel super squicked out, that they feel comfortable, like, telling you, hey, I can't do this anymore. I'm so sorry. You know, can I? Can we fade to black on this scene? Or, you know, things like that. Like, if those communication lines aren't open, then you end up with a situation where they just get, you know, they just keep it inside and they get resentful. And that's not good either. Because yeah, you have to have right. other people to role play. You can't do it by yourself. It's not like fic writing. It's not like drawing as far as, you know, <laughs> fandom um, and nerdy activities go. Like, you have to do it with other people. So. If you're doing it by yourself, it's called novel writing. That's right. <laughs> I saw and this none tweet. of us want to do that. <laughs> yeah, we're all too lazy for that, right? So, like, I saw this tweet one time where somebody was like, oh, you know, I want to I wanna write an adventure, um, you know, Dungeons & Dragons story, but my friends are all busy. How do I do Dungeons & Dragons by myself? And then there's, like, an, an hour later, there's, like, a tweet underneath it that's like, I have been told this is called writing a book. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Um, I think also... One other piece of advice I have for if you're going to be writing an, a um, villain is you 
you have it is the hardest thing and i sh- i struggle with it having written villains for years and i know i know all of us have struggled with it also it is not an uncommon thing that because people because you are the villain and you are the antagonist people will dislike your character and they will talk about disliking your character that does not mean that they are disliking you but also that shit hurts and that is valid <laughs> It does hurt, right? But I think, and I think that, you know, we have to know, we have to know when to, to log off and, and, you know, not read the chat for a bit because the reaction that they're having is the reaction they're supposed to be having. Like you're playing a villain. They're supposed to not be liked, right? And as much as that hurts and that's annoying and that's frustrating because at the end of the day, we're all people and we want to be liked. Like we have to recognize like, okay, this is not good for me to read this chat right now, but you shouldn't try to stop it. I don't think because then what's the point of you playing a villain if no one's allowed to openly hate your character, right? Like, what's the point? What are you doing? So, um, so you know, knowing when to just close the chat for a moment, I think, is really important. Yeah, I think I think it gets into gray area too because you also don't want to. The chat can and and has become places where it's like, oh, this is all that's happening, and now I can't engage in my community. Yeah, because that sucks. while I am while I'm very glad that this is the reaction that I was aiming for and going for, and that's what I want a hundred percent. I also like, can we, when we're saying, God, I, I hate that so-and-so did this. He's a terrible person. I, I can't wait for him to die. Uh, can we just like also tell me as a writer that I'm doing a good job? Thanks. <laughs> because, because hoping my character that, that I've put my heart and soul into will die is great. But at the same time, like, I don't want them to die yet, please. <laughs> I'm still writing a story. Yeah, I think that's yeah, right. valid. It's like, it's like three months in, please. I want you to live a little longer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, also, I think a pet hate of mine is when um, when one villain gets all of the sort of hate and pra- praise almost, when it's like, no, but they're not actually the bigger villain here. <laughs> oh, yeah, that happens <laughs> sometimes that. too. I, I would like to think that that is... Um, That is a compliment. It sucks and it hurts still as a writer, but it is also a compliment on how well your character was written maybe versus how the other person's, the other villain's storyline is happening. Um, Which is not the nicest feeling when you're not actually writing a villain, but people hate your character anyway. (laughs) True. Um, Yeah. And that happens all the time. Like your little baddie gets, gets all prey. It's like, (laughs) Yeah. It's it's a di- it's a difficult situation and it's it's really hard and it's these sorts of things that that require that's is part of why you need a tough skin when you are writing a villain is is part of this. It's not just that you know you have to write bad things. It's that people are going to have justifiable reactions to those bad things. Yeah, absolutely. Sorry, I've got it on mute because she's. Oh, you're good. She sounds so cute. She's making such the cutest little noises. <laughs> she's just like, pay attention to me, mommy. <laughs> no, no, I'm sorry. I forgot the I forgot the British accent there. So it was pay attention to me, mommy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Poor thing. I know. Poor thing. But yeah, so I think that that is that is the, at least the advice that I have is basically end of day uh know that you need a thick skin and know that that thick skin comes with practice yeah it does and you don't have to jump in all at once you know um you can you can totally like wade into the villain water slowly you know what i should have done that i didn't do i'm just gonna Mm. call myself out here i should have rewatched my my villains video and and you know to hear what (sighs) advice i gave in that and i totally didn't i'm sure there's other (laughs) advice and i just can't remember it right now because it was so long since i wrote that video um, how so, dare you not know, know everything right? that's in every single thing of your videos uh, uh, but the thing <laughs> is is it's so funny because I, I wrote it so I feel like I, sh- I should in a way I know that's unreasonable that's like so unreasonable but um, but I, I wrote it like I mean I do research for my videos but that villains video like I, I know I didn't research it I know I just wrote it because um, a lot of videos are uh, they my advice comes from like my experience and for those I don't do too much research so I'm just like oh why don't I remember because I feel like there was like four or five tips in there and so I know there's something else, but Lord, I cannot remember it. <laughs> it's fine. We've probably talked about it or we'll talk about it in the next 45 minutes. Probably. So. <clears throat> It'll probably All be right. coming up. Karen, 
Yes. Tell me about the favorite villain that you've written and uh, why did you love playing them? Oh my gosh. So actually, it's going on right now. Um, <gasps> my favorite oh. villain experience is writing Haley in um, in Atlantis that we're doing right now. So to give you guys that are listening some background, um, this is a, a uh, boring factions like mob violence role play. And um, as part of the process for that, uh, I took on playing the boss of one of the families, right? And so that's um, Haley, which is actually, she's Haley from the Vampire Diaries and from the originals, but um, I adapted her, right? It's an AU for her. So, uh, so that's who I'm playing right now. And the reason that I'm loving her so much is because this role play gives me the opportunity to just be like unabashedly bad, right? Like that's what people are expecting from her. You know, people are expecting her to be crazy and fly off the handle. They're expecting her to have like these insane reactions because she was basically raised as this mob princess, you know, to take over the family when um, when her father passed away, which is essentially what happens in her backstory, right? So people are expecting it from her. I don't have to think too much about like, you know, this this character trait specifically or that character trait specifically. I can just have her be unhinged and it will be accepted, which has been so fun. So like, I'll give, <laughs> I'll, I'll give an example. We had this plot um, where her husband slash the underboss of the family got poisoned. And this was great. So what I did was I put out a call that was like, hey, who wants to fight Haley? And I got a couple of bites, right? I got a couple of bites. So what Me. I had happen, yeah. So what I had happen was as soon as um, he got Elijah, so it's it's hey Elijah um, that we're doing for people familiar with the originals. And, uh, and uh, so I put that out. And so as soon as Elijah gets poisoned, Haley just goes off. Like she goes off. She she's a she's um, popped off. Yeah, like she she's a shifter in this verse. It's also we have supernatural creatures, right? So she can change into a wolf and a few other things. Um, so she goes off. She instantly like turns into a wolf. She jumps over the table. She attack. She like is trying to go straight for the boss of the other faction, who ends up getting protected by her people. So she ends up attacking this other person that's a member of that faction and just gets into a whole thing. Um, she she does injure the people that she's fighting but she actually comes away with the worst injury in that particular fight um so i broke her leg <laughs> and she had to be in a wheelchair for like two weeks and she had like two months after that where she had to use crutches and be very ginger with herself which she really hated she was very frustrated by that but you know it was wonderful it was wonderful to just like have her freaking go off and um i love consequences for characters so i, I found it very interesting to uh to do the research for like what do you do if like your leg is severely injured and you're you know and you have to basically like not walk on it for a long time you know yeah. so so that that experience right there has been uh has been my favorite villain just a chance to like really cut loose and uh and whatever crazy stuff people threw my way i'm able to say like yeah sure Haley can do that <laughs> <laughs> it was hilarious though she ended up the most injured even more injured than the husband that she did <laughs> which is which is very chaotic, Haley. Like, like it, it made perfect sense, and I and I was here for it mostly because my character hurt her. But um, that's another story. Um, I think it goes back to what you were saying before um, the advice that you would give to people. Sorry, my little one was kicking off there. You're good. Um, oh, you're I good. Would, I would say just accept consequences. What? Mm. Because that is a prime example. You know, she popped off but she was she was bad she was bad off at the end of that um and rightly so because she took on a, you know a room full of people essentially that was that were guarding Ari yep so I would say yeah just beware of consequences you have to accept consequences you know you villain can't win all the time ultimately they're going to have to lose yeah even if they win sometimes they have to lose at the end they have to yeah. lose at the end so you it's might as well start accepting sometimes. now that there will be consequences yeah yeah me oh wow there's two more right there is that you will lose as a villain um it is not a satisfying story for the villain to win uh even in a game that is all villains it is not satisfying for the most biggest bad to win uh also the goal of being a villain is not being the biggest bad the goal of being a villain is what the story needs in order to push the story forward yeah okay yeah um okay naomi Tell me about a character. Tell me about a villain that you just that just is wonderful. And why did you love playing them? Um, what did you play them? 
Well, I have to mention two. I can't. I can't. Oh, that's. Uh, I figured we'd go round robin until we all ran out of characters, and it was going to be four hours later. Oh, but yeah, yes, can't choose between. Can't choose between the babies, right? Right. Um, well, the stuff that we've done. I mean, I can't get into right now. I can't get into the seven years that I've done with Brie and Summer. Um, probably a bit later, but um, between the, the the things that we've done, I would say Elijah and Lucian mm -hmm. would be mm. the two that I have to talk about. Um, I want to talk about Lucian first. My um, baby. Yeah, I, I miss him. <laughs> I'm playing Elijah right now. But I miss I miss Lucian so much. He was a ride. He was. He, he was a. He was a lot. He was a wannabe necromancer. And it was such a win that I convinced you, Karen, to let me do that plot. That oh my god. One of my biggest wins in roleplay ever. For, so, for context... Oh yeah, go ahead, Karen. Yeah, for context, like, I... One of the tropes that I really hate, because I see it misused all the time, is, um, is coming back to life, right? So I tend to not let people do anything, no matter how magical it is. I tend to tell people, like, you can't be a necromancer, you can't bring people back from the dead, like, you can't do that, like, I'm sorry. But I just don't... There's too many ways that it goes wrong, and it gets cheesy, and it gets stupid, that I just don't... I don't trust it, right? So, and it's not that I don't trust, you know, Naomi. Uh, I do, but as soon as I let Naomi do it, that means I have to let everybody do it, which is not right. Like, because I, I, the level of trust it takes for me for that is just like, everyone in my RP is not going to achieve that. Um, you know, at my heart, I'm a shy bitch, right? Which I, I say that a lot. So this is never going to happen. It's never going to happen because I, I'm not going to trust you in that way. Um, so even though I trust Naomi, I was like, I, at first I was like, I can't let you do this. I can't let you do this because then someone else is going to ask me. And, and so she had to like sell it so hard. She had to like basically explain to me the entire freaking arc. And we had to make it set up in such a way that it was like unique to, to Lucian so that other people couldn't do it so that I had a good way to say like, yeah, I know. But you can't because that takes up his story and that's what makes him unique. So you can't do it, right? Um, and, and basically the only way to be a part of that story was to like be his apprentice or something like that. Like that was the only way, the way it was set up. So she had and to craft so all hated. that and sell it to me. Have anything to do with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so she had to craft all of that and then like sell it to me. Um, so yeah, that's that's the backstory there. But eventually, uh, eventually she wore me down and I said yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah. What about Lucian was just like villain quality? What did you love? I think he's the mental acrobatics that he did to justify what he was doing for me um, mm. he would just stop at nothing to to find um, a cure for the soul sickness which was essentially a um, something that um, would end in death um, or basically your character would end up an NPC if it happened to them um, mm -hmm. he wanted to cure basically a magical illness uh, there, there was no cure for it at all, um, and because they were they, they had Bronze Age technology essentially, plus magic, um, he had to really dig deep, um, and it was months and months of like him finding um, a scroll that would lead him to a cave with a dragon, and then the, all this to, to end up um, essentially finding the cure for death, um, and he would just stop at nothing. And it, it destroyed him, basically. Um, it was just so fun to write out the the little tricklings of conscience he had here and there. And he only had that because essentially he was alone for most of his life. He ended up killing his wife. Uh, but then enter Landon's character, uh, Cassandra. <laughs> and he, was, he wanted to manipulate her, essentially. Um, so good. Yeah, so he ended up falling in love with her, as you do. Um, and that conscience just sort of eat away at him, and then his daughter troubles that his daughter had was eating away at him. And you can't be this this big villain and and you know have a conscience, so it, it ended up destroying him, and which was, was wonderful. Fun, was fun yeah, it is very well. I I uh, very grumpy old man. I very quickly have to say that uh, Naomi, you have you have fangirls in the uh, chat right now. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> about just like fangirling about how you're so good at selling people into plot lines and it's everything true. like that. So Naomi does not. 
Naomi does not take no for an answer, like in a good way. Like obviously if I had said like hard, hard, no, absolutely not. Like she would have backed off, but you know, um, but like, I think, I think deep down you, you knew that you could make me like it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> and like, so... and that's the, that's the, as long as you do the work, right. That's the biggest thing about it. As long as you put in the work and the justification and the reasoning behind all of these decisions, which Naomi is so fucking good at doing. Uh... And his, his, character, his character was basically half, Frank, uh, Dr. Frankenstein, half Hades. Yes. It's like, yeah. this is necromancy, God damn it! I need it. And then he, like, um, and the, the sad thing is about him, or sad for him, not sad for the world as a whole, um, but sad for him was that he never he really found the cure to soul sickness. What he ended up finding was something that was that was much worse. Um, yeah. yeah. Like, yes, it was a cure for death, but it wasn't, like, it wasn't anything like what he really wanted, but it was the only thing that existed, and he managed yeah, to yeah. find it. Yeah, he thought that, you know, he could connect the two, you know, it must mm-hmm. be, you know, if he could cure death, he could cure soul sickness, but it ended up just destroying him. Um, yeah. And, you know, that was the main thing I pitched you was that it's not going to be good for him. He, he's going to get this, but it's ultimately going to be one big pile of crap after the next for him. And, you know, I think he, he came back to life and then his entire family died. And yeah. And he couldn't save them. He was required yeah. to kill. And he was basically Sorry. cursed at that point. Like he was completely <laughs> yeah. cursed at that point. Nothing was ever going to go good for him after that. Yeah, nothing. Um. All right. So tell me about Elijah. Elijah. So I've been playing him six years now. Yeah, it's like five or six years. Yeah. Um. I just, I just love him. He's just the way he, he sacrifices himself. Um for his his family and his brother he would just do he would do anything and he would absolutely justify anything to um save his family he he doesn't care who you are what you do uh, nothing matters to him but the goal is you know obviously to redeem his family or to to, to protect his family and currently doing that with Hayley in our role play Atlantis um you know the ultimate goal is to see her safe and get um get Rob home and he would just do about just just about anything, um, and he'll do it in this charming, you know, very very um, just I think quite a attractive way of going about it. He's very suave, so, right? <laughs> yeah, he'll be so ominous, and he'll just he'll just you know as if he's talking about the weather, and, and he's talking about separating the twins or you know torturing someone, and it will just be. It'll just be come easy, e- as easy as talking about the weather, um, and I love that. I love that with him. That he just has this like berserk switch, like this trigger that you know, if it's his family or someone he loves, that's it. You know, move out the way. Um, and I love that about him. Whereas Lucian was was a bit, he wasn't quite physical. He wasn't. He you know, Eugene managed to almost knock him out, but Elijah has that physicality on his side where I can use that a bit more and he, he's quite intimidating in his uh, posturing I think I, I quite like that about him playing that I love that yeah I do too Elijah's uh, Elijah's one of my favorites um, he's great uh, great character and I think that the way that you render him in particular just really brings out um, all of his all of his most uh, interesting qualities oh, I think you. Yeah, I think that he is the uh, he is the pinnacle of like like you talked about how Lucian had this like had justifications for things. Yeah. Elijah's morality is just his morale. Like he is just like nope, this is okay, this is okay, and this isn't. There are certain yeah, things yeah. like mess that are just not acceptable. Yeah, but exactly. you know what? Murder and mayhem is totally fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know, Dammy Bun just went a little bit too far, and it was just like how dare you? Like, yeah, no, and really? I think come on, you're not any I love. You. I loved that like unwavering I love that unwaveringness about him is that he is he is rigid in a way of his of his beliefs yeah. um and the way that he looks at things and also what he is rigid on versus like how we would view what would we should be rigid on is two very different things and I like that. Yeah. Yeah, he definitely and, uh, has his own code. Something that I'm enjoying is the ability he has to sort of talk Haley down whereas cuz yeah. She's just going mental at the moment and, and he's just like, but okay, but if we do it this way. And he kind of has a, bit, a little bit of a balance. 
but as things are going on and on it's you know he's he's losing that ability to sort of keep her in check I think yeah I as think she... she is too because she's getting as she's kind of like growing in her role as the the boss of the family um she's kind of getting to where like you can't tell her no right yeah. like as 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 she grows in power she realizes she actually doesn't have to listen to anyone regardless of whether she should or not so no. you know she gets she she kind of is able to to push him push his advice down despite the fact that she should be taking it right um with you know, certain assassination <laughs> you know. <laughs> <laughs> no idea what you're talking about speaking, um. speaking of speaking of that um we we actually probably need to do a plot update on wednesday about the thing that you guys had said <laughs> needs to change which i agree um so don't let me forget we need to work on that sometime today <laughs> mom's job are never done guys yes, right <laughs> for the audience listening <laughs> um actually that's also a great uh transition into my villains Ooh, i have yeah. two um so karen if you have another one then we'll we'll swing back to you as well okay uh for your second one but uh we'll start with uh the person who has the you know hit on him as he is <laughs> rab um I actually I liked I like talking about Rab in forms of villain in his original form um, because I I really do think that I just I hit it out of the park and I've been striving ever since to get there um, <laughs> not to toot my own horn I, I he's adapted and changed as uh, our, our piece have adapted and changed I've been playing him for seven years uh, alongside Karen and her wonderful rendition of his his soulmate. We're going to talk about her next. <laughs> oh, perfect. Um, but Rab is a very flawed human being. Um, he is he is extremely dependent on his needs and what he wants when he wants it. He he has he is the definition of a psychopath with very little impulse control, um, but also a beautiful narcissist who uh just thinks that the world is he's probably actually more borderline than narcissist who thinks that the world is just trying to constantly wrong him um and hurt him <laughs> and he just happens to be the victim in his own mind which means that he can then do all of these terrible things like you know murder women because they look like a girl he has a crush on from school uh which is the plot line that his original plot line was <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and he um and he he really is he really is like so wrapped up in himself like I oh, he's yeah. like the best example of like paranoia gone rampant right oh a hundred percent and it's not even it's the weirdest kind of paranoia because it's not even paranoia that is um that is like they're all out to get me he doesn't give a shit if everyone's out to get him it's more <laughs> like they're all talking bad about me yeah <laughs> yeah um and like his original so he is he is a cousin of he's not a cousin but he is um his original character was based very loosely also off of klaus michelson who also happened to be in the uh in the with Haley and elijah uh mm -hmm. but he was not originally to play with Haley and elijah as you guys have him he does currently but so it's like this paranoia, big, bad, something to prove, uh, but also trying to be like an actual human being without being a decent pu person. He is he is my psychopath and I love him for it. We love him too. <laughs> he's just Come so home. he's <laughs> he and he makes some ridiculous choices along the way and he he stumbles into things not expecting consequences like it's a very interesting uh thing to play because i as a player and writer know that there are going to be consequences but rab doesn't seem to understand <laughs> that there are consequences to his actions so when he does things like just go crazy and um you know literally, literally like i think it was maybe an hour into the opening and he basically made the entire role play go mental oh yeah no in in, our, in in atlantis he literally was just like he was like and this is so he's this the is mayor he's the mayor by the way yeah he's the mayor in atlantis and this is when i separate uh muse from mun sometimes and he literally was like um landon i know that you have the uh <laughs> i know that you have the uh 
keyboard, but I would really like to do this thing <laughs> called a blood bill. <laughs> and we really just want to starve the vampires. And I, as Mun, was like, that's idiotic. And he was like, but is it? Um, and then he did it. So <laughs> it was smart. It was very smart. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's that's just kind of how he plays. And so he has very different renditions. But he is he is obsessed typically on one woman and will just try to consume her in literally any way he can, mostly trying to kill her. Um, so yeah, that's that's Rab, the my wonderful idiot. Um, and that's where I come in. <laughs> yeah, talk to me talk to me about his soulmate slash better half <laughs> so um we talked about this a little bit last week in our biggest mistakes episode because we went through a lot of our history of how landon and i met um and so that's part of where our friendship blossomed is that she had created this character uh for rab and um she was like i need uh, a lady character for him to obsess over and i was like sure that sounds great and essentially what we what we built was an alternate universe clara line right so yeah to be fair i was like have you seen was. this show <laughs> that's what it was so um so she was writing rab with a, a joseph morgan face claim oh we've got a sour mara raccoon i'll have to deal with that okay so she was doing that and then i was like okay well so i'll you know play um basically the the caroline right so we're gonna have um candace Acola face claim and but her name is abby so she's not really like Caroline exactly, um, and the reason why is this is one of the things that I love about her so much and why I really like playing her is the thrust of her plot in general is basically that she is becoming corrupted. So she starts out in this in this one place that's either a relatively good person or a basically normal person or a person that's doing the best they can in their circumstances, right? Like something something that is. Um, that's understandable or pitiable or even good sometimes. And then over the course of the story, I like to move her more and more and more and more to just being an awful, terrible um, <laughs> disaster of a human being, right? Um, so it's the opposite of a redemption arc. Yeah, uh, that's what she's for. That is what she's for. She is for the opposite of a redemption arc. And during this this opposite of a redemption arc, she tends to um, meet Rab and uh, and go on adventures of love with him, and um, and do a bunch of other awful things. Like in Atlantis, currently she is an assassin. So she she grew up in this kind of um, assassin's world, and that's what she became. And um, then she got this job to go and kill Elijah on Atlantis. Unfortunately, when she got there, she had realized she bit off a little bit more than she could chew. She got captured. She got turned into a vampire. Um, all of these awful things happened to her. And now she's an assassin for the mob family. She's a vampire assassin for the mob family. So she's wrestling with this idea that she used to kill supernatural creatures. Like she used to be a supernatural hunter and now she is one of the supernaturals, but she's okay. She justifies it because she still gets to kill supernatural creatures, which was ultimately her goal, right? And her newest target is Rab. <laughs> <laughs> because Mr. and Mrs. Smith is such a great plot. <laughs> yeah, so that's the plot that we're currently playing. And it's just, it's just, a, it's basically... All about Abby getting worse and worse over time and succumbing to her baser instincts, succumbing to her more um, reactionary thoughts and, 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 and taking those thoughts and, um, and putting them into, you know, actual awful actions. And, and so, so that's essentially what, what she'll go through through the course of the, the role play. She'll just become worse and worse and more bigoted and more bigoted and um and more into the killings that she does so it's essentially are you trying to sort of create her becoming her own antithesis yeah pretty much that's what i'm always yeah. trying to do um and well in a couple of role plays i didn't write in a couple of role plays she had positive arcs but most of the time what she does is she starts out you know in a place and gets like progressively worse um over time until she is literally her own antithesis exactly yeah She's wonderful. I love her so much. <laughs> she just she she balances and feeds Rab in such a way that it, it is only Abby. It will only ever be Abby. <laughs> the um, one he couldn't kill. 
<laughs> the one he couldn't kill. The one he so desperately wants to, and yet every single time is just like, well, maybe keeping her around would be better. <laughs> and he always ends up deciding to, right? Yeah, I mean, so far. <laughs> so far. So far, we've not written one where she actually dies in the end. I don't know. We haven't really decided what we, kind of well, ending we're doing for Atlantis. So we'll we see. We haven't. Um, I I personally, because I love the ship so much, I'm like, let's keep them alive because let's not. Which is very funny because half of my other characters, I'm like, they could die. <laughs> um, <laughs> but I, as the, the writer in me is also like, but like, what if they consumed each other? It would be wonderful. I mean, right? So, um, so yeah, that's, that's Abby. And, and what kind of inspired me and interested me in writing her is, is literally that, like, that negative character arc, because you don't get to see yeah. that super often, like, so often, yeah. we want characters to go on positive arcs and do and do better than, than themselves and things like that. Um, and that is very, very, um, you know, a very nice thing to read. And it's very uplifting. But it doesn't always have to be that way. Sometimes people get worse. Sometimes people get yeah. worse, like think about, you know, I'm sure we all have that family member that seem that used to be chill oh God. and and now they're you know basically a reactionary and they say the most awful things so people it does happen to people like it does happen to people as they as they yeah. have experiences in, in life and and they age they get less tolerant so um so that's a very real thing that i don't think it gets explored enough in fiction so i like to take the time to explore that i love it all right so Definitely. my the only, the only one i should think of is is daenerys targaryen yeah. 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 And, yeah. and, and they did for, that. Sorry. They did it so quickly and so not. Yeah. What as well with, as they could have. What you're doing with Ari is much better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's taking a bit more time. We're, get, we're gonna get there. Yeah. Ari is perfect. Um. All right. And so then my my second character or villain that I want to talk about is uh, the trash fire goblin party that is a uh, party <laughs> goblin that is uh, Phoebe. <laughs> <laughs> I can't even. Phoebe. Um, Phoebe is... The thing Phoebe is, more than anything, is a victim. Uh, if you told her that, she'd kill you. <laughs> but she, she, is, she is a victim of circumstance, a victim of codependency, and a victim of her own self-torment. Um, she is the definition of self-destructive. She... Her, her whole purpose is to... Be as chaotic as possible and choose all of the worst things for herself while also keeping in mind that the readers and or myself are trying to like be like no actually your life could get better if you made the right choices and then like have this subtle like oh I can make the right choices and then slam it down and be like oh actually she can't make the right choices and that's just Phoebe poor thing um yeah how she is in her current uh her current predicament mm -hmm. is that the thing about phoebe too is that phoebe always has a um she has a half like she is a half a person she is not a full functioning person on her own uh this person is typically the person who is her, her other half is typically related to her in a brother sense most typically, likely typically and, we do fraternal twins with them right <laughs> typically yeah, yeah typically not always but usually yeah um and she she is held down and, and abused in that relationship she's also an abuser but she wouldn't admit that it's just love um <laughs> yeah and, it's, hope syndrome. It's, not, it's just codependency <laughs> the definition of codependency um and she she just she gets me so angry sorry <laughs> she so right now as she is she is extremely traumatized from her history and her past so she has um, mental disorders at the wazoo, uh, mostly suffering from some sort of dissociative disorder, which has been actually really, really fun to play and try to research and and uh, and involve in a lot of her arcs where there's a lot of amnesia and dissociating, um, which has been great. And how her arcs always work out is that she she gets worse she gets better and then she gets way worse again uh so it's been really fun to try to try to watch her climb out of hell only to make her make the bad decisions in self-sabotaging ways we, so. love Phoebe. we just want the best for her but she never gets it every iteration <laughs> i can think of um she never gets it poor thing no she's so tragic it's 
she is i mean and that's like that's the whole point of her right is i i, I write her for the tragedy just because i'm <laughs> a masochist like that uh is that i what the angstmeister yeah the angstmeister <laughs> no i i write her for the purpose of people do not always make the decisions that are best for themselves even if we think they will be so she's been an addict before she's been codependent she's had eating issues there's always some level of self-sabotage and while she is very rarely the the main villain it is typically her partner that is the big villain um she enables that and that makes her villainous in her own way mm, so she's an enabler yeah love so love we, we love phoebe <laughs> we do <laughs> anyway um so yeah the, the, i guess that's our experience as far as uh whom we who we've written and and how we've written those plots um, I very quickly wanted in like our notes and stuff, I had the idea of talking about discussing the difference between um, the main villain and also playing side bad guys mm. um, with and, and Naomi, I, th I think we kind of talked about that a little bit as far as like when we started talking about advice and the fact yeah. that Lucian in his iteration was not the main villain. Yeah. Um, but what what con what like what is different there? What? we should just talk about that and brainstorm that for a bit. Like mm -hmm. what makes the main villain versus villainous characters? I feel like with his example, he wasn't the main villain because uh, his, his ultimate goal was going to, I don't know if you'd essentially call it good, but it wasn't the worst thing either. Mm. You know, to cure soul sickness, to bring back dead. You know, you could, you, you could get behind that. Um, whereas his son, his goal was to, well, he ended up a fascist. Let's be honest. Yeah, I mean that's pretty much <laughs> what happened. He took over yeah. the town and um and got real fashy real fast. <laughs> so I think the big bad, you know, his ultimate goal would have been so bad for the the, the entire world that we were role playing within. Um, whereas Lucian's goals kind of affected himself. Okay. It, it ended up that way. You know, he ruined his own life and his, his wife's, his children. Okay. So it's, Maybe it's, more than himself. But So know. it's ultimately what makes the villain a main villain versus a side villain is how they relate to the overall story. Is that yeah. kind of okay. what you're saying? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think I would basically agree with that. I feel like when it comes to, to role play, like it really depends. It depends a lot on who's willing to do the proper planning to do the big bad things because the more like plot affecting your villain is the more that your villain has to die at the end and the mm. the harder that that is to do like it's hard to kill off a character especially for role players because you often don't even get to that point in the story so um once it's once it's here it's like you have to let go and i think that is very very hard for a lot of people so um i think that's that's a big difference when it comes to the main villain like you have to be willing to kill that character and just a lot of people aren't. So so having that willingness and crafting the story towards that end is a big part of it. Yeah, I agree. I think that I think that, that crafting. I also think that because role play is very much based on what the group is, there are situations where we have been like, "Oh, this is a great side villain." And then the main villain has been dropped in our laps. Yep. Um <laughs> It just right. happens that way. Oh, okay. I guess everyone hates my character. We're going with it then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> like, it's like that. It's it's with, like, Damien at the minute. Um, you know, his actions are not going to affect Atlantis overall. Whereas Haley and Ari, you know, the big bads, there's well. You know, they can, you know, consume the island. Yeah, they, they, have, they have political and economic power in a way that Damien doesn't. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but everyone loves to hate Damien. <laughs> well, because he's so he's overt, terrible. right? He's so overt. He's he's done so many horribly violent things. He's a bigot. Oh, yeah. He's like he's very easy to hate, right? Yes. He's like he's yes. like your your next door neighbor that won't stop, you know, <laughs> saying awful things every time you see them. Um, you know, even though your next door neighbor has no actual political power to hurt your life. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's like that. It's like that kind of dynamic, but in a role play. <laughs> well, and I, I, 
agree with that. And I think that that is so what's so like unique and wonderful about, first of all, about Atlantis, because everyone's a villain, villain and a bad guy is that like there's overtness. And then there's also what is the political strategy? What is the subtle villains? Um, all of that fun things. Mm-hmm. But I, I think that also keeping in mind that that's very close to, like you said, you used a real life example. It's very close to real life. It's really hard to hate the people in charge, even though you can, but like to actively hate them. Uh, it's way easier to just be really annoyed and hate the person who like cut you off. Right. Yeah. Like it's so think- it's so easy for me to go yell at my annoying bigoted neighbor. It's not so easy for me, you know, to engage with um, with a bigoted politician. Right. Like they're yeah. very different things. That comes under the you know the problems that you'll face when you do play a villain. Um, yes. Just to go back to that. You know, it's kind of safe where you are. You know, you have to be behind a screen using a keyboard. Uh, you know, you're not going to get hurt, you know, your life isn't going to change, but in that situation, you know, it's easy to, to have your character react in a way that isn't realistic for them because they're in such danger because you're safe. Yep. Um, and I think you will experience that a lot of times when you're, when you're playing villains. If you, if you do play villains prolifically, you'll, you'll come across that. Yeah, somebody um, that's like, that will do something that's like, that's not real. Like you would never, no one would ever do that. You would die. Like, but yeah. because it's a role play and because you're safe, they'll do it. Cause they know that the, the truth is they can't kill your, you can't kill their character um, unless they give you permission because that's, it's exactly. a role play and you have to give consent. So, yeah. you know, you encounter that, um, that sort of struggle. <clears throat> yeah, absolutely. All right. So we are creeping up on two hours here. So give okay. me, we, each of you, each of us will give one last piece of thought or advice as far as what it takes to either be a villain, what makes a good villain, anything about the discussion that we've just had. Uh, Karen, why don't you start? Give me, give me your last words. Okay. So my one major piece of advice, and I know I've said this a lot, but, but it's, it's true. Like it's from my heart. What I think is the most difficult thing about villains is being accepting of conflict. Like you have to be so willing to hurt your character and not in like a superfluous way. Like it's got like lasting damage will be done to your character as a villain and that's something that you have to be okay with like you can't you can't just say like oh well they can have their feelings hurt like that's not enough if they're a villain you have to be willing to have them hurt and have them lose sometimes they don't have to lose every time but they have to lose enough that they are still a villain right because at the end of the day that's what makes them a villain is that they're not going to win the story very true Agreed. i like that all right, Naomi. Naomi, I don't know why that that name came out. <laughs> Naomi, go ahead and give me your uh, your last piece of advice on this topic. I think uh, just be careful uh, when you are allowing others to hurt your character or potentially kill your villain, because there are a good few people that you'll have ended up hurting characters in the role play. You want the most satisfying ending that you can. Mm. So, in my mind the the revenge should or you know the death of your character should go to those that they've hurt um you know it's no good just giving you know making that or you know just making a villain maybe get run over by a bus or you know uh, ending themselves you know that's not always the most satisfying ending for your villain if you spend maybe three months to a year really um you know making other characters lives a living hell you know they deserve part of the you know part of your villain and that's what i would say just be careful with with the ending yeah i agree with that as far as if they if everyone has a stake in and at that point that you have to you have to be aware that you are not just writing between you and an audience of one you are now responsible for kind of everything and how that story comes together with a nice bow so to keep that in mind yeah um my advice and my last thing is uh do it try it try writing a villain try questioning things and questioning the morality of your character i think it's really fun taking a character that you like and is morally good and twisting them and changing the rules a little bit Uh, and that's a great way to start is just start twisting the rules um try it because i think that everyone has the capability of writing it and i think it's a really satisfying way to write characters and it will really inform you as a writer um, and a reader how to look at characters differently if you are willing to cross over that villainness line. Absolutely. Good last um, words. 
Thanks. Great. All right. So very quickly, uh, before we do our, before we say goodbye and everything like that, I have a little bit of an article. It's not really an article. It's just like little fun news. Okay. Tell us. Um, And I chose this particular one uh, because we have someone from across the pond joining us today Um, that someone projected a smiley face on London's parliament parliament building uh, in London last night. How cute. Uh, It was 20. yeah, it was 27 oh, yards I wide. I didn't even know that. Yeah, 27 yards wide. So it was right under like the clock t- the clock tower uh, area. Uh, and it was like from the ho- someone from the hospital had apparently projected it. Uh, oh and God. it's just a big ass smiley face. And I think that we all need a little bit more smiley faces in our life. We do. I love it. How cute. Um, what a good <laughs> oh. what a good little like art project for whoever did that. I yeah. yeah, I mean, I think it's just wonderful, <laughs> and all the wonderful like chaotic, neutral or chaotic things that you can do with a projector. That this has been just beautifully wonderful um, to do a smiley face because there's so many worse things you can do. So I'm here for it. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. Well, we wrapped up really quickly, so we have about five minutes left. I don't know if we want to just sh- shoot the shit or if we want to just I don't know. Yeah, talk no, about how everyone is. We can go ahead and we can go ahead and start wrapping up. Um, so right. so we only have five minutes left. So in that last five minutes, you know, a couple of things that I want to kind of reiterate is that we are going to be taking this stream and posting it as a podcast. So if you do yep. prefer to listen that way, you're more than welcome to do that. Go check it out. You can find it on Spotify. It is called Interstage Window. Um, we also have an Instagram that's promoting it. Again, Interstage Window. So you can follow us there if you'd like to check it out. Um, the VODs also, as always, of course, are available on my youtube channel so that's if you want the video along with it so if you want to see my beautiful face and the the game that i'm playing um you're welcome to watch on my youtube channel um and then of course you know uh, give us a follow on twitch if you enjoyed today's stream and you want to make sure that you come back next week please go ahead and follow us um here and uh and we stream uh every saturday pretty much from noon until two eastern time so that's when you can come back and check us out and it's always going to be about some kind of nerdy um role play or role play adjacent topic uh so if you are a role player if you are active in fandom writing things like that then we have stuff for you here and also we're really chill so we're always going to be playing chill games like this like right now it's viva pinata um but you know it's someday i'll finish viva pinata right and we'll play some other game but it's always <laughs> going to be something chill like this so if you like just like kind of chill hang out talk about nerdy role play things then then this is uh this is the stream for you <laughs> yes and also um do me a favor and peer pressure naomi so that she can come back because it's been wonderful having her yes um <laughs> we enjoy that so uh please do that also a quick edit to what karen said our instagram is enter underscore stage underscore window oh okay. i'm sure that I there are underscores <laughs> you're good i'm sure that there aren't many enter stage windows out there but i also don't want them like expecting nerdy uh nerdy stream fun announcements and actually what they end up with is some creeper entering stage window so yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then also we had Naomi as a guest this time. So thank you so much, Naomi, for joining us. Um, we're happy to have other people on as guests or if Please. like you need role play advice and you want to like talk it out. If you are interested in coming on the stream and talking to us about the topic or talking to us about a role play question that you have or a role play problem that you have, then what you need to do is join our Discord. Um, Landon, if you could pop a link into the chat so that people have that. And um, and then message Landon. So she does all of the coordinating for us, the behind the scenes coordinating. I just play the games and kind of faff about, right? Like um, like I don't I don't do anything. She does all the work. So um, <laughs> so you're the wonderful her. face. So. Yeah. So message her. Um, let her know that you're interested, and we will make sure that we um, that we have uh, some way to get you on. Um, so that's how you, that's how you get on, like Naomi did today. Yeah. Also, if you have ideas for topics or things that you want us to discuss, uh, we will literally talk about almost anything for two hours. Yeah. So, yeah. Please. Anything role play related, fandom related, like that type of stuff. Like that's that's our jam. Um, and also, if it's like not, I'll find a way to make it adjacent. I'll figure it out. <laughs> Just let me know. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, thanks, I think that's guys. it. Thanks for having me. Yeah. Of course. We love you. Thank you so much for coming. Um, Naomi plays the best villains. That's why specifically when we yeah. found out she was going to be available this week, we were like, oh, this is when we do the villain topic, right? I <laughs> fangirl. I fangirl over Naomi's villains, and she knows it because I'm constantly in her DMs about it. It's really <laughs> embarrassing for me, honestly. Oh, but I'm it's so real, you. though. <laughs> All right. Well, this has been wonderful. Uh, thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, we're going to go ahead and save and quit our game. And let me switch back to just webcam only. Uh, let's go. Here we go. All right. Thank you guys so much for coming. Um, follow us on Twitch here. Subscribe to my YouTube channel. Um, you can find all of the information for that down below. Uh, Landon in, in Maine, right? That's your... your yep. um Okay. Yeah, Landon in Maine. That is her uh, Instagram if you want to follow anything that, that she is doing. Um, you know, she has a bunch of, of content and stuff that she works on as well. So that's where you can find out all about that. And uh, yeah, everybody, y'all have a, a good day and a nice rest of your weekend. Don't forget to be awesome. All right. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye.